you who don't know me, I'm James Edward Mills, your host of the latest edition of the Joy Chip Reading Project. And um, I'm pleased today to introduce this month's author, um, former acting National Park Ranger, David Bella. But before we bring him on, we're gonna be talking about his book, Ola Ranger, My Journey Through the National Parks. I'm really looking forward to this conversation tonight, but before we get started, I also wanna make sure that I acknowledge that I'm screening in to you today from Madison, Wisconsin, um, which is the ancestral homeland of the Ho-Chunk people, a place called for time and uh, memorial as Day Joe. And I think that it's really important that wherever you are in North or South America, you take the time to acknowledge the place that you live now home, um, because at one point it was occupied on the ancestral homeland of Native people. I'd also like to thank the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison for their support of this and other online discussions hosted by the Joy Chip Project, um, as well as the financial contributions of the Schleck Family Foundation, the National Geographic Society, and the National Park Service, who provide us with the funds to pay our speakers on each of our discussions every month, a small stipend, because I believe that friends don't let friends work for free. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Joy Chip Project, I'm a freelance journalist and independent media producer, and I have a specialty in outdoor recreation and environmental conservation, but I have a further specialty in covering issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion in the management of our public land. And I also teach a course at the University of Wisconsin called Outdoors for All, and many of the books that we talk about on the Joy Chip Reading Project are part of our reading list. Um, much of what we discuss are things that share and celebrate the lives of people of color and our relationship with the natural world through memoir and academic research. So again, tonight our guest is David Vela. He is the former superintendent of Grand Teton National Park in Wyoming. He has also worked at the National Park Service as the director of workforce inclusion, also the director of National Park um, Service Southwest Region. He was a superintendent of George Washington Memorial Parkway, Palo Alto Battlefield National Historic Site, and the Lyndon B. Johnson National Historic Park. Uh, David was nominated to become the director of the National Park Service in 2018, um, and the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee voted to advance his nomination, but unfortunately, he was never confirmed by the Senate. However, in 2019, under then Interior Secretary David um, Bernhardt, um, it was announced that he would be promoted um, to become the director in, in an acting capacity of the National Park Service. David Vela is the very first Latino to lead the National Park Service. And as we are celebrating this week, Latino Conservation Month, I'm very happy to introduce my good friend, David Vela. David, welcome to the Joy Chip Project Reading Group. Thank you, James. Thanks for the opportunity to be here. I'm, I can't tell you how, how glad I am. I really, really, really enjoyed your book. And I'm just gonna go ahead and dive into my first question for you. you know, I think like most of us, you began your interest and love of the national parks at a very early age. What, what can you tell us about those, that first early experience that you had visiting your first national park when you were young? I remember as I was preparing for my confirmation hearing in the Senate, uh, I called my parents and I asked them, why did we make that trip to Yellowstone in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, which is our first experience in a national park? And my dad said, because he was hearing stories from, from some of his coworkers about their family trips. Uh, so we are from the, the rural farmlands of Southeast Texas and uh, with very little planning and uh, not a lot of financial resources, we made that trip along with my two younger siblings uh, to Yellowstone. Uh, and the first national park that we stopped at was Grand Teton National Park. And if you ever been to Grand Teton, you'll know what I'm talking about. It is an American Serengeti. When you see those mountains of majesty, the Grand Teton and the Teton Range, you can't help but be affected. So that first park experience uh, led me on a journey of a lifetime. And that's why. Well, and I also understand that you had, um, you know, just one look at a, at a, a park ranger in uni uniform carrying a, a sidearm. It was you decided that that was an image that you wanted to emulate. Um, what was your path towards becoming a park ranger yourself? How did you yeah. put yourself in a position where you can don the, um, the gray and green? 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, it was from, from Grand Teton, we went to Yellowstone, and I remember at Old Faithful, there was a ranger getting ready to go on backcountry patrol, and he had two horses, and he was wearing back in those days pistols uh, and a Winchester rifle. Uh, and as a teenager, I had never seen that before. And I remember telling my parents, uh, did you see that? You see that guy? It, uh, he gets paid to, to do work in a place like this? And, uh, and who knows where he's going, but uh, again, I, we had no references to parks and park rangers, and as a teenager, I never forgot that. So I uh, went home and uh, went to, of course, graduated from high school, graduated from Texas A&M University with a degree in, in park management, and then began my journey in the National Park Service, first starting in the missions in San Antonio. We were actually the first rangers to open up the missions in the early 80s. Uh, and I was, a uh, well, back then we were generalist rangers, uh, but never forgetting that image of Yellowstone, wanted to, to wear that weapon uh, and moved to Appomattox Courthouse National Historical Park in Virginia, where I became chief ranger and went through the Federal Law Enforcement Training Academy and put on that weapon and experienced what I saw in Yellowstone. Now, as a, a per person of Hispanic Latino descent, I would imagine that you were one of very few people of color that were doing that job at the time. What was that experience like for you as a young first year, early career National Park Ranger? How did that all go for you? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because folks may think that, you know, and, and when we pulled up to, to Grand Teton and Yellowstone, clearly there was no, no visitors that looked like us uh, and there were no rangers that looked like us. So. It was a little intimidating in the beginning till we chilled out and said, wait a minute, this is part of our American birthright. As, as taxpayers, American citizens, let's enjoy it. And we did. The interesting dynamic, though, that first experience in San Antonio, over 90% of the staff were Latino mm. because the superintendent, who was Latino, as the first government employees, you know, when you put on the green and gray in San Antonio, the first thing that comes to mind is the Border Patrol. And I can't tell you the number of people we went into restaurants around the missions in that uniform were no longer in the restaurants uh, because they saw us as the border patrol. Uh, and so my first experience was quite an amazing one because we spoke the language, we were in, engaging with the Latino community, many of the descendants of uh, the indigenous populations that then became uh, Catholics and then and then uh, Spanish citizens and, and so forth that are still there today. So the superintendent with Christie's Nettles believe that the staff need to reflect the community, speak the language. And we really have one shot to make it happen. That's why. Sadly, over the course of my 30 years in the Park Service, we've gotten less diverse than when I started then. We've done some other good things. I'm sure we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, but uh, but it, that was my first experience. As I moved through the system, uh, I later found that I would become the first to do the first Latino to do this, the first Latino to hold this position. Uh, and sadly, in some cases, you know, it took over 105 years for the first Latino to be nominated by the president and or prior to the nomination process to be appointed by the secretary. And, and so we have a ways to go. But back then, it was a different scenario. Well, and it's it's really interesting because I know that the the appearance of national park rangers as agents of law enforcement can be very off-putting to a lot of, of of people who are concerned about their immigration status or you know frankly just aren't interested in in you know having a negative encounter with anyone in a park. What were your best efforts to perhaps? make people that you're encountering more comfortable, you know, as you're seeing them, as they're seeing you, as you're interacting with them, not at necessarily as law enforcement, but for national park interpretation. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really good question. I think you have to just one, to your point, own it, own the narrative that you may not be able to take a traditional approach and wearing a uniform when you're going to a community meeting. Uh, and you're trying to build synergy and relationships that the uniform, especially in the Southwest, may not be a good idea along the border, uh, the border states. Uh, so going in civilian clothes may make better sense. Uh, or, but definitely engaging audiences before you go and to say, hey, look, uh, 
give me the rules of engagement. How can I put this community that I'm trying to engage in a better place? What advice do you have for me? Uh, and we don't traditionally do that. We just put on our, our, our gear and we go to work. Uh, but there are times in certain communities that you need to take a pause, ask the questions, and then respond accordingly. See, I, I really was amazed through the course of your book, the different places that you worked. I mean, you've been in the Southeast, you've been in the Northeast, you've been out West. And I can only imagine that that must've been really, really hard on your family to, to move around that much. You know, one of the things I was, I was curious about through the course of your career, what typically was it that made you decide that it was time to go someplace else? Was there a, yeah. a series of things that had to come together in order for you to decide, okay, this is where I'm gonna make a career move and I'm gonna take my entire family and I'm gonna move them across the country? Yeah, absolutely. And it's a very difficult, uh, challenging decision. Uh, and, and I speak to Park Service mid-level uh, uh, managers and, uh, and others now on just issues like this, uh, kind of tied to emotional wellness, because these are, these are critical decisions. I remember the toughest conversation I had was with my wife's mother. Uh, she was the youngest of seven and telling her, we're going to move to Virginia. And, uh, and, and, and her dad as well, that was the toughest conversation I've ever had to have. Uh, and, uh, and I learned a lot from that conversation because they had no uh, understanding of why in the park service you had to move for promotions and, and that type of thing. So I, for, for me, it was uh, key, a joint decision. And remember, I, I'm, I'm, I've been married for over 43 years and I talk about, Melissa has more um, sites in the reference the sex and the index than any other person. And that and there's a reason for it because these are these are partner decisions and they have to be. Having been in law enforcement, not only in the Park Service, but as a, as a federal agent, uh, I've seen challenges when those decisions are made jointly and the consequences of them. Uh, so for me, it was about um, one, experiencing different parts of the country, but also different genres of American history. So we started off with Spanish colonial. Then we moved into Civil War. Then we moved into the Revolutionary Colonial Period. Uh, then at the, on, the, um, on the Parkway, George Washington Memorial Parkway, you know, more contemporary times, Iwo Jima National, you know, the, the memorial there and uh, Great Falls and, uh, and more modern contemporary. Um, and then uh, Regional Director, 66 National Parks in the Southeast and the Caribbean Diversity of Parks. Uh, so for us, it was about experiences. We raised two kids in the Park Service. One is following in my footsteps as a chief ranger at Castillo in Florida. Uh, uh, and uh, just meeting new people. Uh, but also, too, the law enforcement piece was important. And then later, uh, although this wasn't planned, into management and into and administration. I mean, again, a very long and, and distinguished career. Yeah, I, I never like to ask anyone what their favorite park is, but um, what did, were the most challenging things that you encountered as you're moving around the country? I mean, because, I mean, it, it seems like you, you um, were able to, to dive right into a new place and do very, very well there, but are you to believe that it was that easy? I mean, what were some of the things that were challenging you and your family in order to be successful in these duty stations? I think learning as much about the communities uh, when you're applying for a position before you apply. Because when you apply, you go with the expectation, anticipation, I'm gonna get the job. And when I'm off of the job, I'm gonna accept it. But prior to that, I'm gonna do my homework. And I gotta tell you, when we moved from San Antonio to Appomattox Courthouse in Virginia in the early 80s, um, we were, if there were other Latinos in Appomattox County, Virginia, we didn't know them, we didn't see them. But I'll tell you a quick story that illustrates the point. Uh, our daughter was a little over two years old, uh, Christina, born in San Antonio. We're at a restaurant and we're the only people of color in the restaurant in the town of, of Appomattox. Uh, and there's an elderly couple that, that's looking at, at us. I mean, just staring intently. And I, I know, happen to notice, and you know, I grew up in a segregated community in Southeast Texas. I, I know discrimination. We, we lived through it. 
Um, and my first thought was, okay, um, here we go. Uh, is this is this my worst case scenario? Uh, and so I was thinking in my mind, okay, if what were we if if we're going to talk, what are we going to talk about? And uh, you know, and so let's just see what happens. So she and her husband paid the bill, and they're walking right past our table, and they stop, and they said, um, "You." And I'm paraphrasing. You folks aren't from these parts, are you? And uh, and I said, "No, ma'am, we're not. In fact, we just moved here." And uh, she said, "Where where'd y'all move from?" I said, "Well, we moved from Texas. I work in 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 the in the National Historical Park. I'm the chief ranger there. Uh, and uh, really, we just we just got here." And then she said, "Oh, that's nice." And then she said, "Well, what are you?" And uh, and then she said, "Are you Hawaiian?" And I said, no, ma'am, we're, we're, we're Hispanics, we're, we're Mexican Americans. Uh, and I started to explain where we're from and, and it became one, James, one of the most polite, engaging conversations I've ever had. Uh, she, was, she was just curious because there was no one that looked like us. Uh, in fact, our daughter, again, who was two years, I had these dark hair and, and when Christina would, would be in the park, uh, cause we lived in the park, uh, they used to call her a doll baby because she had this black, black hair. Oh, look at that beautiful doll baby. It was one of the most amazing experiences we ever had in a community. Welcoming, engaging. Uh, and so again, a person of color, you're in the 80s in the South, and um, it just blew my mind. It was a wonderful experience. I mean, I can only imagine what that had, had been like for you, but I, it also seems like you have a certain amount of resilience as well, because you know I can imagine other people taking it, that whole that entire exchange that you just shared in a completely different way, and have had yeah. a completely different outcome. You know, with because it, it sounds to me that you came to it with a lot of of generosity and compassion of your own and patience. You know, to yeah, allow this person to ask what or yeah. pretty silly and obtrusive questions is, yeah. is that part of being a good interpretive ranger, especially if you, you know, don't look like the people that you're sharing stories for or with? Yeah, I, I think that um, I was blessed. And in the book, there are three themes that I talk about. One is faith, the second is family, and the second is country. My role models were around the, the, my, uh, my bedroom, my parents. Uh, my, my dad was fighting civil rights struggles, uh, formed a LULAC chapter in our, in our community. Uh, excuse me, got his master's degree from the University of Michigan, was a PhD candidate, he was a college counselor. My mother worked at the local junior college. He ran for office as an example, political office in the 70s. Uh, and every time he ran, I think he ran three times, it was the most voter turnout in the county and he lost every race. Here's the irony. His son, I'm the oldest of three children, ran uh, in one of the same seats that he was seeking in the 70s, in the 90s, and I won by 20 votes. Mm. Uh, and so uh, so I think that we learned uh, through faith uh, humility. Um, and, uh, and, and frankly, that helped me throughout my entire career based on the issues that I faced, even sitting in the director's chair, uh, when I when George Floyd was killed, and you may remember reading that, and having to make a decision to whether we remove Confederate Confederate statues from national monuments, um, and so I think that progression of life experiences really helped me. Uh, and also in law enforcement, especially as a, as a federal agent working on the streets in, in New York City uh, back in the eighties, uh, that ten year absence I had from the Park Service and then running a state law enforcement agency for the Attorney General of Texas. So I think the law enforcement, our training help, clearly uh, my life experiences, um, you know, the, the gift of humility, uh, communication, clearly you have to be able to communicate. And I found myself in very difficult situations uh, where that helped me, being able to calm a situation down or articulate uh, a point, whether it's with the Secretary of the Interior or the White House or members of Congress. Uh, and here's the key too for me, and I, I talk a lot about this, James, is my apolitical approach. Don't get me wrong, I have my, my political foundation and passions. But for me, my parents always gave me a great piece of advice. And that was, son, if you can't respect 
the person holding the office respect the office that they hold. And it's for that reason that I came out with a near unanimous vote out of the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee for that very reason and for that advice. Uh, and you had to, uh, you know, working in very polarized political uh, climates uh, in Washington and also around the country, uh, you better understand and value and appreciate the importance of working all sides of the political aisle. And fortunately, we did it then, and we're doing that now in retirement. We're going to circle back to all of that, um, because I would imagine that much of what you do is apolitical in principle, but very political in action, because you know, you're navigating people's sensitivities, especially regarding their belief of how government works, how history is, is interpreted. And one of the things that I, I found really interesting was, you know, one of the, the, the I think it would sound from your book, one of the most profound places that you worked was at the, um, the Texas White House, the uh, Lyndon Johnson Historic Park, and you had a had a had a fabulous relationship with Lady Bird Johnson. Um, truthfully, I, I did not know until I read your book that you know she uh, apparently you know, lived until the year you know, two thousand seven, and you had a relationship with her. What was that posting like, and what did it mean to you, and why was it so in, important and meaningful to you in, in terms of your career? Well, she's actually looking at me right now. Uh, one of the most treasured items I have in my study is a signed picture. She had a stroke, uh, and I was superintendent at Linda B. Johnson National Historical Park. And one of the last things she signed um, before everything was auto pinned was a beautiful picture of her in the White House, uh, and she inscribed it. Uh, that picture went everywhere with me to Grand Teton, uh, and it, it hung in the director's office. The relationship that I had with Lady Bird was unbelievable, one of the blessings of my life. I remember, and I'm dear friends with Lucy Johnson and Linda Robb, the, the presidents, their two children today, uh, was sitting in Lucy's office and meeting. I'd just been appointed superintendent, uh, waiting for Mrs. Johnson to have our first meeting. So Secret Service agents come in, Mrs. Johnson comes in, she sit, sits next to me, and all I can remember was, David, don't mess this up. Don't mess this up. You got one shot to make it right, first impressions. I was praying before I got there. And, uh, and we had the most engaging conversations. Uh, David, <clears throat> as an example, uh, what's your vision for the park? Tell me a little bit about yourself. And I said, I'll never forget this. I said, ma'am, I consider myself a product of the Great Society program. And she said, oh, yeah, why? I said, well, ma'am, I'm a product and graduate of Head Start. Uh, in, the, in the 70s, when uh, my dad was getting his master's degree at University of Michigan, uh, we didn't have a lot of financial means. We were on the food stamp program. We were on the welfare rolls. Uh, and, uh, and thirdly, I'm the first Latino to ever hurl this position as superintendent. Uh, and I'm a product of the affirmative action programs as a, as a, as a kid of the 60s and 70s. So I truly believe that I'm here because of a reason. And again, because I'm a product of the Great Society program, I wanna let the world know what your husband and, and the president did for people like me. Uh, and I'm honored to hold this position. That's, oh my gosh, that's all it took. We were, we were crying, both of us, it was very emotional because she saw the connection um, and uh, with someone sitting next to her and the person responsible for managing that beautiful facility and that, that ranch. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll never forget, James, when I moved to run the GW Parkway, there's something called the tribute book. Um, and, and superintendents of presidential sites, properties may have this. We did. By the time I got it, it was this thick. And basically what it does when the Secret Service agent in charge calls the superintendent and says, unfortunately, superintendent, uh, president, or the first lady has passed, um, it triggers all the processes. Every superintendent had agreed <clears throat> to late, when she laid in state at the presidential library, to be with her for 20 minutes. I'm in the George Washington Memorial Parkway. 
my chief ranger, uh, this is two years later, uh, my chief ranger comes in and said, Dave, uh, did you hear the news? I said, no, I, I hadn't. What happened? He said, I'm sorry to tell you, Dave, but uh, Mrs. Johnson passed. Shortly after that, um, I get a call from our regional communications officer, Dave, my phone is ringing off the wall, man. The, the, the media wants to talk to you because they know your story with Lady Bird. I'll make this short. So bottom line is Lady Bird Johnson Park, I did eight interviews back to back to back. Well, we were planning a trip to Texas the next day anyway. My wife flew early, and I get a call as I'm headed to BWI Airport uh, from the family. Dave, uh, you're on your way. And I said, I, I, my condolences, I, I'm still processing. Yes, I'm on my way. Uh, and I uh, said, so, well, the, they called her Mimi. I said, that, well, Mimi had a very special request of you. And I said, name it. And she said, she wanted you and Melissa to be with her for an hour. Mm -hmm. And I said, I will be all day with her. Uh, I, 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 and, but thank you so much. So anyway, we were at the library, former presidents, first ladies, you know, she lies in state. I'm still processing my friend that, uh, that my dear friend has just passed. This Boy Scout's in the book. This Boy Scout comes up by himself. He's dressed in his uniform. He gets to the top of the marble steps and he does this. I lost it. Lost it. All these flood of memories and emotions, you know, came to the service because I was operating on pure adrenaline. It was one of the most moving experiences of my life. But Lady Bird was transformed. She would tell me stories. We'd be stories that you wouldn't see or hear in any history book. The story about how President Kennedy and and uh, and the First Lady were supposed to have this huge barbecue at the ranch after Dallas. She took me up into the room that uh, they had uh, prepared for Jackie. Jackie's favorite color was yellow. We're sitting in the room and she's telling me the story. And you know the rest of the story and history. Wow. I mean, that yeah. to me is absolutely yeah. remarkable because I mean, you clearly had a front seat for the unfolding of history. And, and I know that you served at Grand Teton and um, your good friend, my good friend, Bob Stanton, who wrote the forward to your book was the first, well, well was the, one of the first black superintendents of mm -hmm. a, well, the first superintendent of a national park since Charles Young patrolled Yosemite and Sequoia in 1903, but he's also one of the very first black park rangers to be recruited, and he served yeah. at, at Grand Teton. At Grand Teton. I'm really curious to know, with your relationship with him and other people during this, this time period, how, what did you learn from these historic figures in terms of doing the work of making our national parks more accessible and relevant to a broader cross-section of the American public? Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I, and I tell uh, folks interested in the Park Service and those that are in the Park Service that they find a mentor and find mentors. Uh, I was blessed in so many ways. To find a person of color like Bob Stanton, a fellow Texan, a uh, man deeply rooted in, in, in faith uh, and in family. We had a lot of similarities, to put it that way. Bob told me something that was amazing. Uh, as a seasonal employee in Grand Teton, Grand Teton was a sanctuary, but when he went into the community of Jackson Hole, he left his sanctuary. And he would tell me stories uh, that I never encountered, uh, you know, when I was superintendent of Grand Teton. Uh, and it was fascinating. It was the sign of the times. Uh, but I had this, and I mentioned this early, I had this 10-year uh, absence. My last uh, 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 site, uh, I was a district ranger in Philadelphia. Uh, and the, uh, the federal government was developing inspector general's offices, uh, which were internal affairs and fraud, waste, and abuse. And they were providing salary career paths that Park Service wasn't providing. So anyway, I left the Park Service, was gone for 10 years, uh, worked, uh, worked in New York City as a federal agent, came back to Texas, worked for a renowned member of Congress, Congressman Mickey Leland, that tragically died in a plane crash in Ethiopia. Went to work for the Attorney General of Texas as Director of Field Operations. Later, the direct the Attorney General appointed me as Director. Uh, when he decided not to run for a ter third term, uh, you know we were going to be looking for a job, so I wanted to come home. So I called Bob, Director Stanton, then, and uh, the rest is history. So Bob, not and and he still we talk often uh, is still my mentor, and I had the honor of deep honor of having him. I received a NPCA's a Centennial Award, uh, and Bob was there, and Director Chuck Sams, who replaced me, was there. This is the first time that three directors of color 
we're in a room at the same time. Uh, you can't get more blessed than that. So, and, and, and Chuck and I do have a chance to communicate as often as we can. But Bob uh, and Fran Manila, the first female uh, director, same thing. Yeah, I've, I've seen that picture of the three of you. And I got to tell you, to me, it's very inspiring, you know, to, to see that arc, you know, of experience, that arc of history. I mean, the, the three of you, I think, from Bob from the beginning and Sam to the president, you in the middle, you know, I definitely think you have the ability to tell a big, broad story about how we can be successful, you know, as a institution like the Park Service and, and make it so that it works for everybody. You know, and it's really interesting too, because, you know, as you're going through the confirmation and interview process, you mentioned in your book that um, then Secretary um, Ryan Zinke asked you, quote, how do we fix the Park Service? Yeah. So I'm curious if, I mean, this might be a long answer, so don't, don't hold yeah. back. Um, at the time, and maybe even today, what is or what was wrong with the Park Service, and how do we fix it? Yeah, so that was a surprising question. In fact, the meeting with the secretary was a surprise, too, because I didn't know what it was about. I, I, there was rumors that, that I was being looked at or talked about as the prospect to be director of the Park Service. But no one had, had officially contacted me until uh, as Superintendent Grant Pita, we were on a, on a fundraising event, uh, a philanthropic event uh, with our president of the Grant Tita National Park Foundation. I get a call from the secretary's office and say, Dave, uh, where are you? And I said, well, we just landed. We're about to do a, an event uh, in California. How quick can you get to, to Washington? The secretary wants to talk to you. And Dave, you get a call like that, my friend, uh, you know, a range of emotions. I, I said, well, uh, I'll get right back to you. So I called my office. Guys, anything happened to Grand Pita? I've just been gone for 12 hours. And no, no, Dave, everything's fine. And so I called her back. I said, look, clear my calendar. I'm going to Washington. I don't know why. Get into the meeting with the secretary. And he asked me that question. And it was, I think it was that, that moment I realized that I was being interviewed to be the next direct, 19th director of the National Park Service. Um, and fortunately, James, for us, we had been working on uh, what we called Grand Teton next. You know, as we're going into a second century, what does that mean for Grand Teton? What does it mean and who we engage, how we engage, our training, uh, our values in Grand Teton? So we were going through multiple exercises um, and, and also to, you know, dealing with climate change and, and morale and, and the like. So I basically shared with the, with the secretary, I said, sir, uh, I don't know what needs to be fixed. All I can do is tell you what we're doing, what my experiences are today. Um, and and, and I, I shared it with him. Uh, and then he said, I want to, to create a Teddy Roosevelt legacy. How do I do that? And I'll, I, I clearly remember, what's so fascinating is that now I'm on the board of the Teddy Roosevelt Presidential Library Foundation. We're building Teddy's library in, in, in North Dakota. And I remember saying, sir, you're going to have to go after the kids. You want a Teddy Roosevelt legacy? You're going to have to go, out of the, go after the kids. And you're going to need to be as versed in your engagement as you can. Uh, and you're going to need to be transparent about your desires to do so. We need a bigger tent that we have today. We've got issues involving morale. Uh, we've got housing issues. We've got uh, climate change. We've got, and I just, I was just dropping the bombs. Uh, and all of them are interrelated. You can't solve one without the other. So we need a definitive, sustainable strategy that deals with all of this. Long story short, the, the person that called me, who was the White House liaison at the time, after the interview's over, she said, Dave, uh, Secretary has a couple more people he wants to talk to. Uh, you'll probably need to have a meeting, uh, a meeting interview at the White House, and uh, we'll get back to you. And sure enough, that's what happened. So again, I went in not knowing this was an interview, left feeling actually pretty good. Uh, I mean, who can argue with the Teddy Roosevelt legacy? You know, it's a legacy that we still value and benefit today. Uh, so I left that, um, you know, th thinking, okay, if I got the call, I could, I could work with that. Right? Yeah. I, and, 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 you know, and James, no matter whether it's Democrat or Republican administration, you know, I didn't always agree with, pol especially policies. Um, and um, on that one, if that became a policy statement, I could, I could wrap my arms around that one and still am. 
Well, what's interesting though is that you know during the Obama administration, that conversation had already started. You know, and I think in a, in a big way, we were starting to see things that were happening with regard to expanding interpretive yeah. efforts to make sure that we're telling a more comprehensive story. Um, I don't know if you were privy to the presidential memorandum of, of understanding in 2017, where you know creating a lot of these solutions were going to be a, a big yeah. part of that. What happened? <laughs> You know, yeah. I, I, I just look at what happened, you know, relative to what the plans were and what your yeah. ambitions were. What were your yeah. roadblocks? I mean, was there anything in particular yeah. that was making it difficult for you to do that job? Yeah, well, and I'll tell you, I'm on six national nonprofit boards, uh, and I have uh, the same conversations I had in the Park Service with the CEO and our board chairman. The challenge that we have, uh, whether it's workforce, the lack of workforce diversity, um, and, and other RDI interests is we don't sustain the best practices. We don't institutionalize them. We don't make them part of our corporate DNA. When that good idea in, in Grand Canyon, that person or people leave, uh, it may not be sustained. That person takes that energy, that synergy to the next park. That's what the problems we have with the park service is that until it becomes part of our corporate DNA, I keep get, I was keep getting asked, David, make the business case for RDI. I'm going, are you kidding me? Today, you want me to make the business case? So I make it as real and graphic as I can. Quick example. I get a phone call from the chief ranger at Grand Teton National Park. This was before the pandemic. The visitation was exploding. There was a, a bus that overturned. To this day, James, I couldn't tell you if it was going or coming from Yellowstone. All I knew was a, a busload of Asians not one, including the bus driver, spoke English. Not one. I have 500 employees. Not one spoke Mandarin. Not one. Thank goodness the spouse of one did. So we had, it was a triage on scene. So our ambulances were taking injured visitors to the hospital. We sent her lights and sirens and she saved lives. So you want to talk to me about business case in national parks, about making sure your workforce reflects the communities that you're serving, understands the cultures, maybe speaks the language. You can't be more dramatic and real than that. And but it's it's sad that in the, in 2023 we're still being asked, well, can you make the business case? Uh, we're beyond the business case. It's like climate change. We're beyond the business case. When you're dealing with 102 degree temperatures in Texas, as we have for the past 10 days, really? See, I mean, it's, it's really interesting because another thing I've learned in your, your book is that you refer to it as RDI. Most people you know, refer, refer to it as DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, right. The R stands for relevance. Right. Diversity and inclusion. And I think that's really interesting. I mean, what is it about relevance when we're talking yeah. about the national parks in particular? How do you define relevance and what does it mean to you? And, and that's why, and that's a, that's a really good point. That's why I like relevance because I talk about it all the time. If we don't make ourselves relevant to communities that don't know us, if we don't make ourselves relevant to youth that, hey, we need you, you need to be wearing these uniforms, and here's what we do, we're not going to be successful. So we'll get to diversity later. Let's talk about being relevant in your life first. You get to, we, we need to have you see yourself in what we do. We need to see yourself and, uh, at LBJ. Uh, at uh, Independence Hall, at Mesa Verde, at, and, and, uh, and Grand Canyon. If you can see yourself there as a visitor, uh, as a volunteer, as a, um, as a as employee, as a concession employee, uh, then we'll get to the diversity part because we can talk about pathways that you can look at to, to come in and experience that. So I want to be relevant in your life first. Then I'll get to the diversity. Then we'll get to inclusion and equity. Yeah. And, and truthfully, I think equity will come. You know, once I agree. The other yeah, when all those things happen. Exactly. Yes, you're you're and, exactly and I, and right. I think that what you're talking about is being able to create synergy, you know, right. so that people can see themselves as part of the environment that we hope that they will one day fight to protect. 
and, right. and it's interesting because I mean you're doing that job, and I just remember because I was reporting on it at the time when you were you know saying these very things, and I quoted you in a story that I wrote for National Geographic, and ABC News quoted you in a story that they did about um, the national parks race problem, and a certain political commentator on a nationally syndicated news program heard you say those things and insisted that you resign or be fired. Yeah. Um, was that the beginning of the end of your tenure as, as the, the first Latino director of the National Park Service? Um, I think it served as um, a realization that um, my career in the Park Service was winding down. And we can talk about something a little bit more personal too, that's even more, um, uh, it, well, more important than this. But, but clearly I think it was, it was disappointing that, uh, that Tucker Carlson said what he did. I didn't even mention his name in the book, uh, but I've been asked a number of times, Dave, who was that person? So I'll reveal it to your audience. Uh, what's disappointing about that in so many ways is that the 10-year report that the uh, demographic report comes out, and it talks about how the service is doing, but most importantly, what we still have to do. Clearly, we've come a long way. I mean, the Susquehanna the Civil War, we told stories that had never been told. Native Americans in the Civil War, women in the Civil War, slavery, cause and catalyst of the Civil War, not state, state rights, cause and catalyst. Hispanics in the Civil War, uh, products, merchandise, uh, and, uh, and the 250th will give us that opportunity to do the same. Um, uh, and so, uh, so what's what's what was challenging about that was, I didn't know about it. Uh, I didn't know that on his national show that he called me out. Uh, I started getting texts a couple of days later and say, we got your back. I'm sorry you had to go through this. And finally, I had to go to my com, my comms office and say, uh, guys, what's going on? Uh, what did Tucker, Tucker Carlson say? So they went back because they hadn't heard it uh, and they got the feed and they were like, um, OK, we need to we need to have a conversation, Dave. Uh, and I'll never forget that. Uh, and um, and my response was. Uh, look, I don't want to give from a from media perspective, uh, communication perspective, I don't want to give this legs. But at the same time, I want folks to understand why we did what we did. Uh, and uh, um, and and also that we're not hiding anything, that right. we've come a long ways to go. We, we've come a long way, but we have a ways to go. And we're obviously not excluding anybody. And, and frankly, it's ridiculous that anybody would make a comment that I am, and I'm paraphrasing, would be excluding uh, anybody from national parks. That's, that's not what we do. That's not who we are. Uh, and so it was, it was painful, but we moved on because I think it was shortly after that. Uh, and I'm trying to get my timelines together, whether it was George Floyd uh, or George came first or, or this came uh, afterwards, but it was that incident with George Floyd and the whole issue of Confederate statues, um, and um, and also, frankly, some some disagreements with some some policy uh, decisions. Uh, but I didn't know at the time that all this was COVID. Uh, COVID hits, James. You can you imagine what do you tell twenty thousand of your employees? What do you tell volunteers, 50 governors, members of Congress uh, that you're going to do and when you're going to when and or if you're going to close national parks? Uh, there was one stretch of time and I give all credit to our public health service and to my incident command team. We worked 25 straight days, 12, 14 hour days, just trying to figure out a message because right. no one was having a message. CDC was still developing their guidelines. The White House was still developing guidelines. No one had a game plan. We eventually developed one. And I'm very proud of the team that put together the plan that frankly was being looked at uh, government wide. And so, you know, it was one of those things that um, that was very trying clearly, uh, but at the same time we got through it. But my wife noticed that, um, that I wasn't myself, uh, that, 
the 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 time, the hours uh, were really catching up to us. Um, and uh, so my goal was to retire on inauguration day, um, and I just didn't have the energy anymore. Um, and this was not in the book. Uh, in fact, it ends with me making the decision to retire. You and your readers are getting um, a uh, kind of the the the, the last chapter, uh, and and that is that. Um, I decided based on all those number of things and, and frankly, some disappointments, decisions that were being made at the highest levels in the department that um, it was probably time for me to go. So we decided to retire at the end of August. Um, and again, I was going to retire on Inauguration Day, being a political where as soon as the president got sworn in, we were going back to Texas. Uh, sadly, um, as we're unpacking boxes the first month, I collapsed and uh, needed to have quadruple heart bypass surgery. I didn't know at the time that my heart was operating at less than capacity. And uh, my uh, cardiologist basically said, uh, Dave, I don't know if you would have made it to January. So it's a painful thing to talk about, but I talk about it today as a lesson learned uh, to, um, uh, to folks in the park service, especially leaders or emerging leaders about emotional wellness. When you get when when you when you talk about COVID, when you talk about George Floyd, you talk about Confederate statues, when you talk about running a federal agency in a COVID environment, that would take its toll on anybody. Um, but for me, it took a little bit more of a toll than expected. Uh, and so I don't want folks to repeat the, my lessons, um, and uh, hopefully they can learn from them. Well, I got to tell you, I mean, I I knew people who know you. <laughs> And they were all telling me that you know, had you not quit, you might have died. I mean, it was it was that bad. And and I'm I'm really glad to see that you took care of yourself well enough to be able to, to have this conversation with us today. I can't tell you how, how great you look, how how healthy you seem, how your your energy looks great. Um, one of the things that I just think is remarkable is that you know you were managing perhaps one of the most turbulent times in modern history for hundreds of millions of people that visit national parks every year. And I mean, the um, George Floyd, Confederate statues and COVID all happened in the same summer. Yeah. You know, to be able to have all of these happen on, on federally managed lands. I mean, I'm just out of, out of curiosity. I mean, what was the biggest challenge that you that you faced of those three. I mean, what what was the, the the thing that that kept you up nights that compromised your health so badly? Well, and and that clearly did. And uh, I, I tell you, James, uh, as a person of color sitting in the director's chair, when you're getting from the media, you're getting from communities of color, Dave. This isn't sustainable anymore. We can't. It's painful. Uh, how many more people have to die? And we 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 look at these reminders of our of our history. You, you need to take them out. And rioting, uh, statues being defaced, and it was a turbulent time. Uh, and but again, it's it, it, this gets to something I mentioned earlier, and that's where this this faith ethic comes in. I was drawn on it, my brother, uh, hard. Uh, and uh, but here's here's where I came down to, and and I actually I speak a lot about this because in today's times, politically charged times, uh, the issue comes up. But can we still tell the stories of our nation? And my response is, uh, you better. And you have a responsibility. And I, I, I share the experience again, my wife and I, uh, kindergarten classmates going to the movies um, and um, we were escorted people that looked like us to the balcony. And we didn't know at the time, hey, we, man, these are great seats, man. We, hey, there's Johnny, there's Mary, there's Ed, they're, 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 they're downstairs. They don't look like us, but they're downstairs. And after a couple of times, I think we even saw Gone with the Wind at this particular movie theater in, in our hometown, which no longer exists. So I remember asking our parents, well, why can't we sit with Johnny and, and with Mary? Uh, we, we sit in the class, same classrooms, and then we got a pretty harsh conversation of discrimination. This was in the 60s. Well, I have eight grandchildren, blessed to have eight grandchildren, mixed race, African-American, Latino, Anglo. So we still have family in our hometown. So if that theater was still there, imagine the teachable moment, James, we would have, my wife and I, go into that theater and say, hey, guys, they, they called her Mimi, my wife. Mimi and I had to sit upstairs. Well, well, why, Grandpa? Well, have a seat. Let's talk about it. 
that teachable moment's not there. You take those statues away, those teachable moments are not there. I was with a colleague uh, at a board meeting uh, just last week in the Outer Banks. We, we were talking about this the issue having to come up. And he said, you know, Dave, what a lot of people don't understand is that many of the memorials that were put on the Civil War battlefields were put to get put there by Union and Confederate soldiers. They would have reunions after the war. They shook hands. They broke bread. Many of them put them on there. So we remove them too. So it was healing. I, I, I knew that in the back of my mind. I wish I knew it then because I think it would help me to further articulate, no, no, there's a reason. Let's talk about who put them there. Let's talk about why. You remove them, you take the narrative and the interpretive value by them being there. I, I totally agree. I mean, earlier this summer, I, um, I visited the former site of the Robert E. Lee statue in Richmond, Virginia. Yeah. And currently it's a basically a, a mound of dirt and concrete surrounded by a a uh, chain link fence and I kept asking myself so what goes in its place and what story will we tell ourselves about yeah. that place 50 yeah. years from now when people forget that yeah. that statue was ever there you yeah know, we take the time I mean there, there should be yeah. a plaque that, that says that here yeah. once stood the statue yeah. of Robert E. Lee this is why it was put up and this is why it was taken down absolutely and because if it's still there unfortunately 10 15 years from now Somebody's going to need to explain why that chain link fence is still there. Right. You know, so you're just perpetuating a narrative that didn't have to happen. Uh, and that's what happens when we as a nation don't stop and think uh, and make the hard decisions and be inclusive and in bringing all points of view into the room right. and having a conversation about, OK, what do we do as a community? Yeah, well, I mean, like you spent some time at, at Castillo de San Marcos and your, your daughter is there now. Yeah. You know, that site has amazing Ugh. historical yeah. significance. Yeah. I mean, not just the colonial period, but the Civil yeah. War, Westward expansion, um, yeah. and the Civil Rights Movement. The state of Florida yeah. right now is trying to pass legislation to keep those stories yeah. from being told at all. Yeah, oh, absolutely. You're right. I mean, this was a time, James, where it was, it was the Carolinas that it wasn't north or south. The, the slaves were fleeing to, to, to Florida because the Spanish government said, come here, we'll right. make you free citizens, but you have to convert to Catholicism. So you have that, and, and then the assimilation with the Seminoles and the indigenous. So it was a very diverse community. Um, and clearly community with challenges that every community has back in the day. But here's the ultimate irony. Here we get to the 60s and civil rights movement. There's this famous picture of this African-American family in a swimming pool in San Augustine, Florida. And this guy has a bottle of jug of acid and he's pouring acid into the swimming pool. Martin Luther King shortly thereafter led a rally on the streets of San Augustine, Florida. So you go from a period of, 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 uh, of inclusion and uh, again with, with difficulties and tragedies but at the same time, people were becoming free. And you had hundred, hundreds of years later in that same community on those same streets, and you have this happening. Yeah. So the, my big question, not necessarily for you, but almost rhetorically, how do we stop that part? I mean, how do we stop the failed interpretation of real historic events that still have impact today? Yeah. I mean, and we're literally talking about how we're going to prevent that from happening. I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed this conversation and just in respect of everyone's time. If anyone has a question that they'd like to ask our guests, please go ahead and put it in the chat and um, we'll see if we can ask it live. But before we get to that <laughs> four minutes we have left, this has been a great conversation. Um, the big question that I have for you is at the end of the book, you, you do a wonderful job of listing out some suggestions for first year early career park rangers um, and um, and I'm, 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 I wonder if you would share some of that advice with us right now and yeah. uh, tell us what you think should or could be done to encourage these young people to have successful careers in the park service. Yeah, and I have the same conversations with our son, who's uh, the chief ranger at Castillo. He's been there 11 years, you know, as he looks at his career options, same thing applies. 
uh, I, I always, because I'm an example, if you can dream it, you can achieve it. So my advice is, where do you want, what do you want to learn about American history? What do you want to experience? Okay, start there. Again, yeah. we had a, a genre uh, of experience, Civil War, Rev War, you know, Spanish colonial, et cetera. Start there. Second thing, do your homework, do your research. Network, talk to people. They're on site. What's it like? What's in the realm of possibility? Do I have a chance? There are other volunteer opportunities. Remember, volunteer opportunities count as paid experiences in the Park Service. Uh, build your network um, and then apply. Be patient. Uh, here's the ultimate irony. In the 70s, I applied for seasonal jobs in Grand Teton and Yellowstone. Never got a seasonal job. 40 years later, I'm good enough to be superintendent. So what's the moral of the story? Competition is there. Not as great as it was back in the day, but competition's still there. Uh, also, look at other federal agencies. You can all, land management agencies, you always come back to the park service. There's a lot of that cross-pollination, forest service, fish and wildlife service. Uh, go in that way. Uh, go into the Peace Corps. Go in the Peace Corps, come back. You have, uh, um, you know, some, some preferential processes uh, that, uh, that, that gives you a leg up. You're a veteran, definitely, you know, pursue those opportunities. Take advantage of the hiring authorities that exist. Find out what they are and go after them. One last question, and then I'll, I'll close out the hour. One of the things that, that you actually suggested that I ask you is what are your disappointments or, or perhaps what are the things that still have yet to be done, in your opinion, yeah. you know, for the Park Service and yeah. the continuation of America's best idea? Well, first of all, I apologize for all the text messages coming in. I'm actually, my wife and I are headed to the Middle East uh, tomorrow. I've got uh, working on a, a consulting project with his uh, World Heritage Area. So my phone's beeping off the wall, safe travel, safe travel, safe travel. So I apologize to our audience. But for me, uh, not being able to change the, new, the, the needle on, on our workforce. 80% of our workforce doesn't reflect the face of America. Even though I was the first associate director for relevancy, diversity, and inclusion, and I had HR, couldn't move the needle. Uh, and that was because at every level of the organization, not that people didn't believe in it, they didn't own it. You have to own it. Uh, you have to do the recruitment. You have to want to make sure that your parks, for the reason I mentioned with that bus accident, you're as diverse as you can. You have gender, ethnicity, diversity. You have to own the narrative. We don't do that institutionally. We're getting better, but we're still at 80%. Uh, we're doing a much better job in telling America's stories. 250th anniversary will enable us to do that even more. We do a better job of reaching out to underserved communities. We're doing better jobs at doing that and all credit to those on the front lines that are making it happen. But we're not moving the needle on the workforce side. And I'll do whatever I can in retirement to help talk about the value and importance of it and, uh, and, and play a role indirectly in achieving it. Well, David, thank you very much for this wonderful conversation. It's been an absolute pleasure. Good luck in Saudi Arabia. And thank you. the wonderful work that you're doing there. And I want to say thank you for um, our audience. Um, and also thank you um, to our wonderful supporters, author discussions and the Deutsche Reading Project are made possible. Thanks to the Schleck, Found, uh, Schleck, Schleck Family Foundation, the National Geographic Society and the National Park Service in partnership with Together Outdoors and the University of Wisconsin Institute for Environmental Studies. I hope that you'll join us next month when our guest will be um, the great Betty Reed Soskins, um, formerly the oldest living national park ranger and author of the book, Sign My Native Freedom. And it, I think that's gonna be another fabulous discussion. So everyone enjoy the rest of the summer and have a great evening. Thank you so much. Good night. Thank you, James.